Good morning and welcome to St Martin's in Hereford for our service of Holy Communion on this day when we're thinking about the new term and a return to school, to college and university, to the new normal that we're all getting back to. And the last time I did one of these services for the diocese, I filmed it in my home because the church was closed, St Martin's behind me. As you might remember, I was able to film it right at the front of my house because the road behind me, the Ross Road, was almost entirely silent. That's no longer true, the traffic's busy now. And our schools were shut. We're very lucky here at St Martin's. We're right next door to the playing fields of St Martin's Primary School. We were there yesterday after school club has started again which is very exciting and so as we celebrate the return to school and the new term here are, is our service of Holy Communion and we'll be featuring some of the people from our congregation and community who are marking the new term as well. Welcome once again to St Martin's. In our service today, I'm going to be inviting you at different points to stand or sit or kneel. Please, of course, adopt whichever posture you feel most comfortable with or you're used to adopting at that point in the service. I hope you've got sight of an order of service. If you'd like one, you can find one on the St Martin's webpage or we can email one out to you if you'd like. Just let us know. And our service starts by singing our first hymn, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind. We stand to sing.
Jesus is here. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And we remain standing for a time of confession. We come together to ask our Father for forgiveness. We have not always worshipped God, our Creator. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We have not always followed Christ, our Saviour. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. We have not always trusted in the Spirit, our guide. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May the God of love bring us back to himself, forgive us our sins, and assure us of his eternal love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we praise God by singing the Gloria. Gloria, Gloria, glory to the Father, Gloria, glory. Merciful God, your Son came to save us and bore our sins on the cross. May we trust in your mercy and know your love, rejoicing in the righteousness that is ours through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we remain standing to hear the Gospel read. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Peter came to the Lord and asked, How many times should I forgive someone who does something wrong to me? Is seven times enough? Jesus answered, Not just seven times, but seventy-seven times. This story will tell you what the kingdom of heaven is like. One day, a king decided to call in his officials and ask them to give an account of what they owed him. As he was doing this, one official was brought in who owed him 50 million silver coins, but he didn't have any money to pay what he owed. The king ordered him to be sold, along with his wife and children and all he owned, in order to pay the debt. The official got down on his knees and began begging, Have pity on me, and I will pay you every cent I owe. The king felt sorry for him and let him go free. He even told the official that he did not have to pay back the money. As the official was leaving, he happened to meet another official who owed him a hundred silver coins. So he grabbed the man by the throat. He started choking him and said, pay me what you owe. The man got down on his knees and began begging, have pity on me and I will pay you back. But the first official refused to have pity. Instead, he went and had the other official put in jail until he could pay what he owed. When some other officials found out what had happened, they felt sorry for the man who had been put in jail. Then they told the king what had happened. The king called the first official back in and said, You're an evil man. When you begged for mercy, I said you did not have to pay back a cent. Don't you think you should show pity to someone else, as I did to you? The king was so angry that he ordered the official to be tortured until he could pay back everything he owed. That is how my Father in heaven will treat you, if you don't forgive each of my followers with all your heart. This is the Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh my word. That is a tough reading to live up to, isn't it? 
Jesus is setting the bar pretty high for us today. He's making us think about what we really mean by forgiveness. And he's making us think about what the world would look like if we all thought of this passage as applying to ourselves. What if we really meant it? What if we really could keep forgiving until we were tired, until we lost count of how many times? Would our world be different? How would our life at school be different? Or our life at college, or at work, or at home? How would our family life be different? How would we be different? It's an important story. It's an important one that's found in Luke's Gospel as well, but with a few differences. In Luke's account, there's a qualification for forgiveness. If the person is sorry, then we should forgive them. But we don't hear Jesus say that in Matthew's account. He doesn't mention repentance when he tells us what Jesus says about forgiveness, which is interesting. Do we have to be sorry before we can be forgiven? When we forgive one another, do we have to hear someone say, I'm sorry, before we can forgive them? What does it mean if we say that something is unforgivable? What would it mean if we thought God said that? We all do things that need forgiveness. We all do things where we need to say sorry. Just this last week, Novak Djokovic had to apologise. In a fit of peak and anger, he hit a, a tennis ball and accidentally hit a line judge in the throat. You'll have seen the pictures, I expect. And he did apologise, albeit on Instagram, not immediately, not in person. It seems to be a genuine apology, but it would have come across differently if he'd done it face to face, I think. Flying away from the city before saying, I'm sorry, doesn't look so good. But he went on to say that he felt that he needed to turn this whole experience into a lesson to grow as a human being as well as as a tennis player. It's good that he's thinking about changing because we might think that forgiveness doesn't mean very much if it doesn't result in some sort of change in the person needing forgiveness. Would that be right? Because forgiveness implies that somebody's done something that needs to be forgiven. If we have that conversation, what's wrong? Oh, nothing. Doesn't really help, does it? There's nothing to know about that needs forgiveness. Forgiveness implies that someone has fallen short, failed, got it wrong. It might be all sorts of things. It might be hurting somebody's feelings, hurting them physically. Forgetting a special day, upsetting a friend, texting or posting something cruel or unkind. Whether it's a big thing or a little one. If you need to be forgiven, you've done something wrong. And here, as Jesus and Peter are talking about forgiveness, we hear it in relationship to the one who is offering forgiveness. It's important to remember that in this equation we might find ourselves on either side. I get things wrong all the time. I know that I need to say sorry and be forgiven, ask for forgiveness. And sometimes I'm in the other position. I know that I 
have a chance when someone apologises to me to forgive them. I have a chance, even if they don't apologise, to forgive them. And that's about the difference that it might make to me to forgive. The very act of offering forgiveness can be important, really important to the one who forgives as well as to the one who receives forgiveness. It can help you to move on from the hurt and the pain. It can help you to leave them behind. It can help either party to grow. But we can't offer forgiveness conditionally. It, it can be offered in the hope that it will bring about change or redemption, but we can't assume that it will. When I started talking, I wondered what our world would lo look like if we were all better at forgiving and forgiving and forgiving. And of course, it's really easy for me to stand here and preach that other people should be a lot better at forgiveness. It puts me rather in the position of a peasant I once heard about in a faraway land who decided to join the party. He had to go to an interview with the party secretary locally to answer questions about whether he was worthy. If you had two cats, would you give one to the people? Oh, yes, I would do that, he said. And if you had two tractors, would you give one of those away to the people? Yes, I would certainly do that. And if you had two houses, would you give one of those away to the people? Oh, yes, I would certainly do that. And if you had two cows, would you give one of those away to the people? Oh, no, I don't think I could do that. Well, why not? Well, you see, the man said, I do have two cows. It's a lot easier to speak about forgiveness when all is right with the world. It's a lot easier to suggest that other people need to be forgiving, and a little bit harder to suggest that we should forgive, we should forgive other people ourselves. And maybe that's connected to us sometimes finding it hard to believe that we are forgiven by our Lord and Father. Can we really believe that he forgives us? Of course we can. But if we don't believe in forgiving and being forgiven, that can be hard. When we're asked to forgive other people who've done things wrong, no matter how many times we might need to forgive them, and safe in the knowledge that that's probably going to get harder as the number of times ticks on up. Do we try to understand why they did that wrong thing? Do we try to understand the story of the person behind the offence? Because if we just say, well, that is unforgivable, then we run a real risk of not understanding why it happened and why it might happen again. If we blindly forgive people without any sort of understanding, we also might not be helping. We might not help anyone to learn from the situation. Is a culture of forgive and forget really responsible? Whether it's taking down statues or manufactured rows about singing imperialist songs. Forgetting why something happens means risking those things happening again. I follow the Auschwitz Museum Twitter feed. Every day I receive tweets with the names and the photographs of people who spent time in that concentration camp. And there's a little biography of the child or the plumber or the artist 
a human being. And it might say, he survived. Or it might give the day of their death, or sometimes just the year of their death, if nothing more is known. I follow that account so that I can't forget. And I try to understand what would lead really ordinary human beings to allow other really ordinary human beings to be gassed and worked to death so that I might notice if something like that were to start happening again. If I was letting something like that start to happen again simply by being unaware of it. I follow so that I will remember. Because just wiping an offensive past, the Holocaust, slavery, whatever the atrocity, wiping it from the history books doesn't help anyone. If we forget the things which we now judge as crimes from the past, whether it's the forceful taking and occupying of land from others in the name of empire or owning a slave in the name of business, owning a human being for profit, or the attempt to wipe an entire people from the face of the earth. If we erase history, how are we supposed to learn from the past? That danger is as great when we ignore it as it is when we glorify these past wrongs. Because Jesus didn't say, don't worry about it. Jesus said that we should carry on forgiving as many times as necessary. By implication, if we understand the reasons, if we try to understand the reasons, what led people to behave in the way that they did, however abhorrent that behaviour might be to us now, we might learn from it and we might not make the same mistake again. Like his Heavenly Father, Jesus encourages us to forgive and forgive and forgive. But if that forgiveness is genuinely from our hearts, then we will have learned something from the process. Not just the forgiven person, but the forgiver as well. If we really keep forgiving until we are tired, until we've lost count, our lives at school and at college and at work and at home will be different. Our world will be different. We will be different and we will be closer to his kingdom. Amen. Let's stand to affirm our faith. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known to the world. We believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Let's sit or kneel for a time of prayer. Today in our intercessions we'll be praying for parents, students and teachers, both individually and for those within the wider community. 
This time tomorrow, I will be working hard in my English lesson. Lord, we pray for Daniel. We pray that you will bless him and keep him safe and give him all the skills and ability that he needs to make the very most of his education. We pray for all children who will be at school tomorrow and in the coming week. We pray that you will protect them, particularly in this difficult situation regarding COVID. And we pray that you would um, help them to really appreciate their education and the privilege that it is to live in a country where education is free and available to all. And we pray that you would really help each one of them to fulfil their potential and become the people that you would want them to become. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. This time tomorrow, I'll be thinking about getting ready for the new term at university. Lord Jesus, we thank you for Esme. We thank you for the vocation you've given her to care for and heal the sick. We pray that you would give her all the skills and ability she needs to complete her studies as she goes forward. We pray for her in this difficult time of COVID, with her lectures being mainly online, that you would enable her to still find support and friendship with her fellow students. We also pray that you would protect her from all infectious diseases or risks that she might um, come into contact with as she works on the front line. We pray for your protection, for your blessing, for your peace and your comfort and most of all your love to go with her as she returns to study. Lord, we pray for all the students returning to university or going for the first time. We pray for those who are nervous, who are worried about the risks of COVID. We pray for your reassurance and your comfort. We also pray that you would help all to avoid the temptation to flout the regulations because they're ex excited to return and be back together. Help them, Lord, to focus on their studies and to fulfil their potential. And Lord, we pray your blessing, your peace, your comfort, your love to surround them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for parents at this time. We know that it is with much anxiety and apprehension that many parents have sent their children back to school or indeed to school for the first time. There are so many things to be worried about from the risk of COVID infection to the social issues surrounding bubbling. Lord, we pray that you would give those parents peace and reassurance at this time and that they would know that the staff and support staff are doing their very best to keep their children safe. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for those parents who, for whatever reason, find parenting more difficult than they had anticipated. We pray for those parents of special needs children who are presented every day with new challenges. We pray for those parents for whom Childhood trauma has a big impact on their parenting and who just find it a struggle. Lord, help all parents to know that whatever difficulties they have, they're usually not alone and that there is support and care to be found. Help us all, Lord, to do our part to support the families in our communities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we pray for teachers and support staff at this difficult time. We thank you for them as they worked so hard during the pandemic to provide education for the children of key workers at great risk to themselves and their families. We pray that you will be with them and that you would reassure them in these difficult times. We pray that you would help them to manage their classroom safety and that you would help them to with, to deal with the burden of stress, knowing that there are so many risks in returning to school. Lord, we pray protection for them and for their families. And we pray your great blessing upon them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We thank you that you are a God who hears our prayers. And we commend all these people 
and situations to you now. In your holy name we pray. Amen. If you would like to, let's stand to share the peace. God is love. Those who live in love live in God and God lives in them. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And we offer a sign of peace to those around us. If you're at home with family, we offer them a sign of peace. If you're alone at home, I offer it to you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Wise and gracious God, you spread a table before us. Nourish your people with the word of life and the bread of heaven. Amen. The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Why is it right to give thanks and praise? Listen, and we'll hear. Lord of all life, you created the universe where all living things reflect your glory. You give us this great and beautiful earth to discover and to cherish. You give us your love even when things go wrong. Jesus knew hurt and pain. Through him you wipe away our tears and fill us with your peace. You made us all, each wonderfully different, to join with the angels and sing your praise. Holy, holy, mighty and eternal, holy, holy, Hosanna, Hosanna. We thank you, loving Father, because we, when we turned away, you sent Jesus, your Son. He gave his life for us on the cross and shows us the way to live. Send your Holy Spirit that these gifts of bread and wine may be for us Christ's body and his blood. Why do we share this bread and wine? Listen and we'll hear. On the night before he died, when darkness had fallen, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks. He broke it and shared it with his disciples, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. After they had eaten, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks, and shared it with his disciples, saying, This is my blood, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. So, Father, with this bread and this cup, we celebrate his love, his death, his risen life. As you feed us with these gifts, send your Holy Spirit and change us more and more to be like Jesus, our Saviour. How do we follow Jesus Christ? Listen and we'll hear. Help us, Father, to love one another as we look forward to that day when suffering is ended and all creation is gathered in your loving arms. And now, with Martin, Peter, Mary and all your saints, we give you glory through Jesus Christ in the strength of the Spirit, today and forever. Amen. Blessing to God, honour to God, glory and power. say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, Lamb of God, grant us peace, grant us peace. The gifts of God for the people of God. Jesus Christ is holy, Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The body of Christ. Amen. The blood of Christ. Amen. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you and watch over you. The Lord be gracious to you and make his face shine upon you. The Lord look kindly upon you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. And we'll stand now to sing our final hymn, The Kingdom of God is Justice and Joy. 